my name is Tony. Nostalgia seems to get increasingly, um, nostalgic the older you get, if that makes any sense. The past, that place where they do things differently, very differently, represents something of a retrospective, rose-tinted nirvana for almost every generation. Like when I was a kid, older folk would spout off about how they were so much happier way back then, during the World War. I always had trouble squaring that with the history of it. Little things like, oh, I don't know, randomly rationing, carpet bombing, the fear of invasion, millions dying, concentration camps, the Holocaust, rickets, all that stuff. But now I realise that if I'd been young in the 40s, a kid, maybe life would have seemed like one big incredible adventure to me, and that feeling would stay with me the rest of my life. Suppose it's all about context and perspective, and how fucking bad things are in the here and now. I mean, generally bad shit now is so bad makes bad shit then look like good shit. Maybe in World War II, older people idealised World War I or hankered after the good old days of the Boer War, or the Crimean War, or whatever war rang their bell. Thatcher's Victorian values, remember them? If ever there was an example of an out-of-all-sane-proportion misplaced nostalgic reinterpretation of a time in history as something aspirational, that was it. Yes, how great would it be to return to a time of child slave labour and shove kids up chimneys for a wheeze? Literally, subtle do that, give you a terminal respiratory illness. But so what? I bet those kids were as happy as Larry sucking in coal dust, with beaming smiles on their cheeky mouth nourished faces. And their parents were happy too, when they died age 13 from consumption and there was one less troublesome mouth to feed. Lunatic asylums, workhouses, the rise of mass industrialization ravaging the landscape, unsanitary living conditions, filth, squalor, disease, no human rights. Yeah, people were so much happier, things were better because they had self-respect and family values, and Jack the fucking Ripper. The 70s, when I was gearing up, becoming aware of the world around me, was shit in many respects. Some things, though, were good and built to last. In the 60s, I listened to the music my parents listened to, and in all fairness, a lot of it was pretty damn brilliant. In the 70s, I started listening to the stuff they didn't listen to, and that was even better. Also, with equal importance, I started watching the films and TV they weren't into. Horror films, for instance. My parents didn't watch horror films, films. My father hated westerns as well. In fact, he only really liked war films. Probably took him back to the happiest days of his life in a bomb shelter somewhere. Two factors got me started. One, my discovery of a local cinema in my hometown that didn't care much who paid up to watch whatever was showing. Trivial things like how old they were or if they were accompanied by a responsible adult need not apply. Responsible adult. More chance of finding Amelia fucking Yearheart at the bottom of the local factory pond than finding one of those where I live. Second factor, the Monday night horror films that screened on ITV at 10.30 after the news at 10. When I was about 13, I really started to explore the films of Hammer Studios. Now, Monday was a school night and both my parents worked, so they were in bed soon as the news at 10 finished. I had to persuade them that it was a fantastically good idea to let me stay up on my own to watch the scheduled film. I was a particularly difficult, morose and unpleasant child, which helped, because how much more difficult, morose and unpleasant did they think they could stand if I didn't get my way? Then there was the issue of parental responsibility, which wasn't really an issue at all because it was completely fucking absent mostly. Say there was a serial paedophile child killer on the loose and you wanted to go out and play on some isolated waste ground or in a darkened subway. Your parents would advise, just don't talk to any strangers. And off you'd go, potentially into the welcoming clutches of Guido the murdering pedo. So the deal we struck was thus. If I went to bed as soon as the film ended, if I turned off all the lights and unplugged all the appliances apart from the fridge, see that wouldn't overheat due to the shit electrical wiring catch fire and burn the house to rubble and ash along with every sleeping occupant. It's cold. You see? Cold things don't catch fire. Perfectly logical. And if I got up in time for school in the morning and fucked off out post haste, then I could stay up on my own. Fucking yes! So that is what I did. And irreparably wrecked my mind in the process. Enough of my indulgent rambling. Oh, actually no, it's not enough. There's more. Bet you can't believe your luck. It always struck me how great it must have been to 
to be a part of Hammer Studios. It was like this big repertory company. Mostly everything was done in-house by a battalion of creatives on the payroll. Actors, directors, writers, producers, cinematographers, composers, the same names and faces recurred again and again. There was a mix and match on different projects, but the contributors soon became familiar to me. Written by Jimmy Sangster, starring Peter Cushion and Christopher Lee, directed by Terence Fisher, produced by Anthony Nelson Keyes, and so on. Must have been such a cool setup to work for. Recently, Ricky Gervais explained the difference between the pop and social culture of the past and that of the present, by way of the Doctor Doctor jokes. The past. Doctor Doctor, I think I'm a pair of curtains. Well, pull yourself together. The present. Doctor Doctor, I think I'm a pair of curtains. Well, if you think you are, then you are. The primary consideration when making movies was the now alien concept of entertainment. Will people, the audience, want to see this? Will it entertain them? Will they pay us so we can make some more? An emphasis on messaging, communicating propaganda, reshaping social conscience, way down on the list if considered at all. And when they were, their inclusion was implemented with creativity, subtlety, relevance and impact. Today, movies have become the message over and above anything else. A mechanical tick-box suite of ideological sign signals and tokens to include by any means. Whether it will entertain, whether people will want to see it, like it, pay for it, doesn't matter. Because if they don't, that's not our fault, it's theirs, the amusement and thrill-seeking bastards. Doctor Doctor, I think I'm a fantastic, stunning and brave and super artistic wokey pokey mega movie. Well, if you think you are, fuck off. The Bride of Dracula was a frequent flyer on the Monday night horror flick schedule, and a favourite of mine. It's eccentric, mad, contradictory, and skull-shatteringly hokey and dumb, which is all part of its charm and appeal, I tell myself. To get the most out of it, you'll need to switch off the reasoning part of your consciousness and relegate inquiry and logic to a faraway, inaccessible place somewhere in the North Sea. First thing to know, Dracula ain't in it, apart from appearing in the title, obviously, and a name check in the intro narrative in which it is claimed he has been destroyed, but his acolytes live on. A Hammer Dracula film without Dracula. Good start? Well, pros and cons. Originally, Dracula was to return from the dead, but since playing him in the successful Hammer remake in 1958, Christopher Lee didn't want to do it, reportedly citing fears of being typecast. Oh, as if. He was in five pictures released the same year as this, 1960, so he might also have been a bit on the busy side with one thing and another. Although some expectations are then dashed from the off, screenwriter Jimmy Sangster saw an opportunity to approach things from a different angle. It's Transylvania in the 1800s and Marianne Yvonne Monla is the only passenger aboard the coach of a frantic driver, Michael Ripper, as he spares no horses racing through what looks curiously like Epping Forest in the twilight. Marianne is very pretty with lashings of eyeball melting makeup artfully sculpted to her face. The coach clatters to a halt when an obstacle appears in the road. The coachman fears it is a dead body and is relieved to find it's just a log. Whilst he moves it, a sinister a looking man in black emerges from the trees and hitches a ride on the back of the wagon when it takes off again. Arriving in a small village, Marianne goes to the local inn. As per usual, the villagers go all quiet on seeing her and mutter into their ale. Don't scoff, it used to happen in small local pubs in my hometown all the time, and the only vampires there ran local businesses or sat on the town council. Anyway, outside, the man in black pays Michael Ripper some money and he fucks off into the night, leaving Marianne stranded. The innkeeper tells her they haven't got any rooms and she must leave. The locals take this opportunity to fuck off into the night as well. Another coach rocks up, this one belonging to Baroness Meinster, Martita Hunt. Hunt was most famous for playing Miss Havisham in David Lean's Great Expectations in 1946. Here she looks like a Miss Havisham who's died, been buried, dug up two weeks later, reanimated and dressed in some elaborate period clothing. The innkeeper and his wife seem shit scared of the Baroness who invites Marianne to share some wine with her, which neither of them drink, by the way. But then Marianne didn't ingest any of the wine and food the innkeeper gave her either. Not eating and drinking stuff is something of a thing in this film. The old lady, who doesn't seem disturbing or off-key in the least, oh no no no, upon hearing of her plight, offers her a meal and a bed for the night at her nearby castle. Seems Marianne is travelling to a nearby town to take up a teaching position at a girls' school. The Baroness offers to provide her transport in the morning. Well, who could refuse? Most people, I'd imagine. I don't know what Marianne is going to be teaching those kids, but I doubt it involves 
involves common sense and the exercising of caution. In the cardboard castle, we meet Greta, Frida Jackson, a creepy old boot with a face like a bag of chisels and a sly, knowing manner. She's supposedly the only other resident of the castle, a servant and companion to the Baroness. In her room, preparing herself for evening meal, Marianne walks out onto the balcony to take the air, and below her sees a male figure stood on the balcony of another room. Greta comes to get her, almost poetic that, and the man disappears. The Baroness doesn't eat any dinner, claiming she has no appetite, told you it was a thing. Although I do think Marianne may have had a go at the soup, in fairness, the Baroness confesses that the man Marianne saw was her son, who has a long-standing illness and is irreversibly run the twist, therefore never leaves his room. He is cared for by Greta, his old nurse. The Baroness blames herself for indulging him and his crowd of debauched, unsavoury friends who led him to descend into ruinous physical and mental depravity. Later that night, Marianne sees the man down below again, stood on the balcony, surround, fearing he might jump. She runs to his room. There she finds a blonde-haired, sad-eyed, charismatic sort of chap who introduces himself as Baron Meinster, David Peel. He tells her he couldn't have jumped and draws her attention to the shackle and chain around his ankle. He seems quite rational and kindly. He spins some old pony about his mother keeping him a prisoner and spreading fake news about his death. If only Marianne could get the key to his shackle from his mother's desk drawer and set him free, that would be absolutely splendid, and they could both leave this awful place together. Being a bright, intelligent, smart, and inquisitive sort of person, Marianne does just that, which turns out to be a bit of a fucking mistake. The young Baron, once free, sends Marianne to her room to pack whilst he has a chat with his clearly terrified old mum. When Marianne emerges, she finds the Baron has gone, Greta has lost the plot, gibbering, cackling, crying, mad as a shithouse rat, and Baroness Meinster is dead in a chair. Before we go any further, a brief comment on Frieda Jackson's performance as Greta. It's so all-out berserk, so over-the-top, so intensely exaggerated, Vincent Price would have asked her to tone it down a bit, love, and cut back on the ham. <laughs> What's the matter? Yes, that extreme. Seen Dwight Fry's Renfield? This is Renfield Plus with a little bit extra layered on. <laughs> Horrified, as are we all by now, Marianne legs it from the castle. She's found unconscious at the side of the road by coach passenger and premier vampire slayer Dr. Van Helsing, Peter Cushing. He gets her on her feet back to the village and the inn after listening intently to her story. A local girl, Marie Devereaux, has been found dead in the woods. On examining the body, Van Helsing notes the two puncture wounds on the girl's throat. He's there at the invite of the local priest, Father Stepnick, Fred Johnson, who suspects that there is some unholy shit going on involving in the Meinsters. Girls who go up to the castle for a bite and a snooze are never seen again. Yes, the Baroness has been enticing them away over the years as tasty snackaroonies for Sunny Boy. Van Helsing pops along to the castle to check things out. He finds Baroness Meinster. She's now one of the undead and none too happy about it. Yes, her son has sunk his fangs into his mother's leathery old neck. I always thought if you're gonna fall victim to vampirism, best it happens when you're young. If it happened to me now at this advanced stage of my life, I'd have to spend eternity looking like this, and it ain't the best look. Anyhow, Van Helsing explains there is a path to salvation. The path involves a stake through a gnarly old chest, after which her face relaxes into a peaceful expression, as peaceful as a mile of weather-beaten antique goat parchment can possibly get. Van Helsing escorts Marianne to the school where she's going to be teaching. It's run by a wittering old gal, Frau Lang, Mona Washbourne, and her husband, the headmaster, Herr Lang, Henry Oscar. Herr Lang is a pompous windbag and Basil Faulty type sycophant who quickly switches into unashamed fawning when Van Helsing reveals his impressive credentials. Same thing happens when Baron Meinster comes a-calling and proposes to Marianne, who instantly accepts, because he and all the recent events seem perfectly normal now and not at all suspicious. Meanwhile, the slain village girl is coaxed out of her grave by Greta, who cackles and jabbers encouragement through the earth. Greta is the Baron's hench hag now, and the girl is an undead vampire bride. Van Helsing watches this rebirth. He 
he was on his way to the churchyard to give her a good staking, but is prevented from further intervention by the arrival of a rubber bat on a string. The same bat turns up at the school whilst Marianne and her newfound friend Gina, Andre Melly, are making toast on an open fire. Lost in their girly chatter about romantic things and Marianne's engagement, they burn the toast. That's not a euphemism for anything. Whilst Marianne goes to the kitchen to rumble some more bread, the bat changes into Baron Meinster, who gives Gina a prize fanging. Van Helsing tracks Meinster, the undead village girl, and a vamped up Gina to an old abandoned windmill. Meinster gets the better of him and bites him on the neck. What? That's a turn up? How will he get out of this one? Well, the answer lies in a searing hot branding iron and some holy water, applied to the bite site in that order. Returning to the windmill with a terrified Marianne in tow, Meinster reacts to a restored Van Helsing by kicking over a brazier of hot coals and setting the place on fire. He escapes to the outside, but Van Helsing jumps onto one of the windmill sails, pulling it down so it casts the shadow of a giant cross on the ground. Meinster, trapped in the shadow, screams, howls, and is destroyed. The evil has been vanquished. Yay! There are a few elephants in the tomb, or room, maybe enough to repopulate the global herd in fact, so I'm going to have to mention at least some of them. No Dracula, is it a problem? Depends on how much you want to see a Dracula character in a Dracula film with Dracula in the title. Although pragmatically calling it the Brides of Meinster might not have proved that much of a box office draw. Who the fuck is Meinster? A question that would have been on everyone's lips I'd wager, and possibly lose. If the young Baron can metamorphose into a rubber bat on a string, why the fuck is he shackled in his room? Turn into a rubber bat on a string and let the prop guy fly you away on his pole. Now I've seen fan rationalisation along the lines of the chain and ankle collar obviously being made of silver, thus depriving him of his transformative powers. I ain't buying that. Looks pretty much like a yellow metal to me, gold or bronze. The Baron has been imprisoned for years, his mother feeding him on a steady diet of trafficked chicks. Where the fuck are they all? Shouldn't there be a mass rally in sisterhood of feminist vampires, hissy fitting and gnashing their way through the countryside by now, tearing into the throats of the patriarchy with wild abandon? Or we get the village girl and Gina as vampire brides and Marianne as the next victim in waiting. And if Marianne is the one he's going to marry, shouldn't it have been titled The Bridesmaids of Dracula? And how come the idea of coercing one of the women to set him free only just occurs to the Baron? He a bit fucking slow or what? You will find there are pieces of previously established vampire lore missing and new pieces added. Contrivances to suit the script, Tony. Oh yeah, silly me. Thanks. Hammer always did play fast and loose with this stuff. That's enough though, otherwise I'll be here all day, or month, or year. Ironically, a film originally intended for an adult audience throws up questions an adult audience might likely raise. Kids, however, speaking for myself at that age, wouldn't give a shit. And I didn't. Up to a point, I still don't. Because I love it. It was cinematographer Jack Asher's ninth film for Hammer, and he gives it a slick, dreamlike look, so that it resembles an animated painting by Gainsborough, drenched in oversaturated, hyped-up colorization that lends it a luridly feverish visual tone and vibrance. The ghoulish makeup on the two brides and Marianne's meticulous Max Factor slap enhances the painted ambiance. The Blu-ray transfer restoration I most recently watched is lively, vivid, and yeah, impressive. Terence Fish Fisher directs in a steadfast and straightforward manner with a keen eye for the gothic. Sangster's script feels like he woke up one morning after an overheated fever dream about vampire women, realised he was on the clock to deliver a screenplay, and hacked it out there and then before lunch. It's not bad as such, just doesn't think things through, which is generally unlike Sangster. But on the plus side, he does craft in some striking moments that linger long in the memory. Peter Cushing is sheer class, without a doubt the best acting performance on show. Not a difficult achievement, some might argue, but he always had that rare capacity to elevate whatever he was given to another level altogether just by turning up and opening his mouth and making sounds. David Peel as the bloodthirsty Meinster gives it his best shot and certainly looks male shop mannequin handsome and yet concurrently creepy. He lacks Christopher Lee's stoic satanic darkness and towering presence, but he can don the glittering bloodshot contact lenses and hiss like a deflating lilo with the best of them. Physically he's a bit underpowered, but at least enthusiastic. This was his penultimate screen appearance and his biggest role. He quit acting to become an antique stealer and estate agent. Stuck with a bloodsucker vibe then. Martita Hunt was 60 when she appeared in this. She lived another nine years and made seven more films. She looks like she'd be lucky to live another 
nine minutes and make it to the ambulance. I hope it's the convincing makeup because I'd have put her in her late 70s at least. However, she does a fine stately job of conveying an air of crumbling, antiquated nobility, of anguish and guilt at the depraved moral and spiritual dissolution of her only child who is now a monster. Despite which she clings to what is left and does terrible things to preserve the existence of those remains. Mothers, eh? What will we do without them? Not exist, probably. Frida Jackson's overboard turn as Greta I've already mentioned. It's a jaw dropper, but adds to the fun. <laughs> And Yvonne Monla is very fetching as the naive, virginal, innocent in peril. A French actress, you don't say. She quit the business after she failed to secure the role of Domino opposite Sean Connery in Thunderball in 1965. The Brides of Dracula benefits greatly from some standout moments. The village girl emerging from the grave, a symbolic rebirth from the womb of Mother Earth, cheered on by the manic Greta as an overacting gothic midwife on Satan's payroll. The emerging pale hand was a thrilling shock moment for me back in the day. Meinster biting Van Helsing, that's not supposed to happen, and his physician heal thyself attitude of slapping a searing fire iron into his neck, then irrigating with holy water, is quite an inventive and radically effective solution. After her death, Van Helsing as Gina's coffin consigned to the stables of the school, where the stable man and Frau Lang keep vigil. The coffin is securely padlocked. When Marianne relieves Frau Lang and the stable man is savaged in the face by the rubber bat on a string, <coughs> the padlocks fall from the coffin one by one, thud into the floor but still locked. Rising from the dead, Gina slowly advances on Marianne, and in a very brief but suggestive moment predating the lesbian overtones Hammer would apply more explicitly in the 70s to Countess Dracula, the vampire lovers, and lust for a vampire expresses a burning desire to kiss her. With menaces, though. Then finally, Meinster's death scene at the burning windmill. Depending on your perspective, it's either ludicrous or clever or maybe a bit of both. Not something I'd immediately have thought of myself, turning the windmill sails into a giant crucifix. But then I'm not Van Helsing or Jimmy Sangster, and they're far more creative and inventive than I'm ever going to be. In my opinion, it's a super little monument of gothic genre melodrama madness and mayhem from a time when Hammer Studios were very much a force to be reckoned with. Despite the gaping in plot holes and logic scramblers, if you're in a frivolous frame of mind, willing to switch off your brain and be entertained by a garish and threatening slice of unpretentious cinematic antiquity made by people with passion and commitment for what they were doing, it might just fit the bill. Thank you for your time and attention. Do whatever you want to do. Hit like, don't like, comment, subscribe. Be a patron of my Patreon thing. Make a financial contribution via the thanks button. And restore my faith in the generosity of the human wallet. Spirit, spirit, I'll bring you something else soon, whether you want me to or not. Meanwhile, here's a song called A January Day. It was written during a time when I was listening to a lot of Dylan. I had all along the watchtower on a physical and mental loop almost. That's my excuse. Take or leave. The cold breeze didn't cut its teeth on the first road it met. Shut the damn door, you'll let out the heat. And it's been such a bastard to get. I shouldn't grumble, suppose it's New Year and all that. And now Christmas has gone, it gives me a chance to try on a new woolen hat. Please wipe your prints when you leave, who the hell said that crime doesn't pay? Don't wear your heart on your sleeve, on a January I've no intention to grieve Whether 
graveyard or whether you stay. Don't plan on getting reprieve on a January day. The lights went out, we don't have any change for the slot. Take it from me, we're all going down like a crack hole in a car I can't complain, I guess it's all good for the goose. These days nothing makes sense, no punch to the line, everything weird and obtuse. Please wipe your prints when you leave, who the hell said that crime doesn't pay? Don't wear your heart on your sleeve, on a January Day. I've no intention to grieve Whether you go or whether you stay Don't plan on getting reprieve On a January day I once knew a girl She worked in a waterfront bar I think she must have liked me, she never charged me much, I thank my lucky stars, I can thank my lucky The rain muscled in, hammered down on the heads of the poor. This time for a change, we're all getting wet, cause it's not as discerning no more. I shouldn't worry, perhaps it's some great cosmic joke. The field leveled up, no bodies immune We're all in the same sinking boat Please wipe your prints when you leave Who the hell said that crime doesn't pay? Don't wear your heart on your sleeve on a January day I've no intention to grieve Whether you go or whether you stay Don't plan on getting reprieve On a January day